Well, I spent a lot of time in prayer and preparation for today. You might say I've spent my whole life for this moment. I looked over my sermons, my writings, and the steps I've taken through my life. Things related to race and racism, policy issues, and it's amazing that this moment has come when so many people are crying out for justice now, justice for all. This week, people were asking me what to read. I got a lot of texts and emails. I said, uh, look at the database in the sermons of First Church and read what many black and white preachers have been saying from our pulpit for the last 20 years, good place. But I would highly recommend to read How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, and I'd like for as many of us as possible to read that and maybe have opportunities to have conversations throughout the church this summer. Anyway, once we get that through that, we can dig into the other 24 books that the New York Times recommends through the generations to look at racism. But only after we can change what we see needs to be changed. So let's get started. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Everything has a beginning. Today, in the opening words of the Holy Scriptures, Genesis tells our Judeo-Christian creation story, the beginning of new life and the goodness of life that's created by God. Each day of the creation story, God pauses at the end of the day to say, this is good. What I have done is good. And then on the seventh day, God rests because God needs rest too. This beginning is filled with life and hope. Many beginnings are like this, filled with beauty and joy. Not all beginnings are beautiful and joyful. Protests in our streets in Columbus had a beginning that was horrid in the eyes of the world and the entire and the eyes of God. The beginning of the protests across America and now the world began on the ground outside Cup Food Store at the intersection of East 38th Street and Chicago Avenue in the Powderhorn Park neighborhood of Minneapolis, Minnesota around 8.20 p.m. on Memorial Day, May 25th. The beginning will never be forgotten. It was on that night that George Floyd was murdered by Derek Chauvin with assistance from officers Thomas K. Lane, Tal Thao, and J.A. Kun. As Lane and Kun pinned George Floyd to the ground, Tal stood by trying to fend off all help for the man, and Derek Chauvin, with his left hand in his pocket, kept his knee on George Floyd's neck and throat for eight minutes, 46 seconds, while George laid face down, pleading for his life, and surrounded by a growing number of people on the street, screaming for the officers to stop and recording everything. It was the lynching, the execution of yet another black man. Caught on cell phone, George Floyd should never have become a memory on Memorial Day. He never should have died. In the past two weeks, hundreds of thousands of men, women, teens, and children have taken to the streets of the United States in over 700 towns and cities. And now across the world, people are marching and raising their voices about police brutality and violence against African Americans, particularly black men. George Floyd's death, together with Brianna Taylor's death in her home in Louisville, Kentucky, an EMS worker back in March, and Ahmaud Arbery's death while jogging in a neighborhood in Satala Shores, Georgia in February, 
was the final act of violence that mobilized people to take to the streets. People have reacted like never before. 11 days later, there is no end in sight. People, young and old, of all colors and all backgrounds, will not be stopped. They will not be silenced. There is an awakening. There is a new beginning. It is as if people woke up to realize that black lives matter. Let's say it together. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Until we can claim that as our own language and our own belief, things will never change. Everything has a beginning. Black Lives Matter is an international human rights movement originating from within the African-American community, which has led campaigns against violence and systematic racism toward black people. For seven years, BLM, regularly hosts and holds protests speaking out against police brutality and police killings of black people and broader issues such as racial profiling, racial inequality in the United States in the criminal justice system. BLM was born out of the pain of George Zimmerman murdering Trayvon Martin in Florida in February 2012 and then being acquitted for this murder the next year. It was born from the pain of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, and Eric Garner on the streets of New York, like George Floyd crying, I can't breathe. The same form of execution, six years separated, this time by New York City police that brought people to the streets. Seven years of marching and chanting and facing down police in towns and cities across America. Seven years of black victims with numbers climbing each of these years. Since January 1, 2015, 1,252 black people in the United States of America have been killed by the police. They've been killed by the police. This is according to the Washington Post database tracking police shootings. That doesn't even include those who have died in police custody or were killed using other methods. The cry of all lives matter and blue lives matter are forms of drowning out. Black lives matter. So we cannot do that until we get this. The rest of the cries don't make any sense in the face of this atrocity. Until we address the devastation of racism brought against black lives, I feel like we need to stop the counter chants because they're nothing but messing with the truth. Let black lives matter be the words on the lips of everyone in America today. Here in Columbus, from 2013 to 2016, our police rose to the top of national statistics by killing more black men on our streets than any place. Julius Tate Jr., Henry Green, and Tyree King, who was 13 years old when he was assassinated, all were young and black and dead from the weapons of the Columbus police officers. Last Saturday night, when the protests came to the corner of Cleveland and Broad, there were rubber bullets and wooden projectiles like this one, fired at people in the Washington Gladden Social Justice Park. If you're not getting mad, when's, what's it gonna take? Tear gas had been fired earlier in the day and throughout the day. As our own 15-year-old activist, Alicia Palmer told me we were peacefully demonstrating and everything was going fine. I didn't hear any shouts, any screams that were against the police and all of a sudden tear gas was shot into the crowd. She said I, had, I ran four times last Saturday to avoid the tear gas. Carly Kuchbaugh was maced and threatened by the police. She said I, I never threatened them, I did scream when they maced me, 
But that was a reaction, not an action against the police. They came after me and others in the crowd. The roots of this violence in the Columbus Police Department are something of which I have become all too familiar and aware as I have stood with black and brown officers in the CPD and black and white clergy to address the internal racism within our department. I have come to learn from one conversation after another, one report after another, there is a deep-seated racism within the Columbus Police Department that is systematic in nature. It is not just a few bad apples. It is a culture that eats away at our city's police force and makes the entire tree sick in an orchard which is now infested as well. I was listening to more and more stories yesterday from retired and active police who were on the phone saying, this continues to be a problem. And no matter what you hear in the press coming from City Hall, I can tell you the officers themselves are the ones that I'm listening to. Who we listen to will determine what we hear. I ask you to believe me, this is really sick. Hundreds of stories I have heard, often whispered for fear of retaliation, would make you sick too. The roots of all of this are found in the ground itself. Seeds planted 400 years and 293 days ago. It is a sickness that is like none other in America. Racism is rightly called our original sin, but I would also say that racism is our first and worst pandemic. Racism is certainly the longest standing pandemic in our nation. It has embedded itself in the cellular structure of America since its arrival on August 21st, 1619, in the nascent viral form of white men selling, quote, 20 and odd Negroes. They didn't even have names. They just didn't even know how many they had. All they did was sell people on the docks of Point Comfort, Virginia. If that isn't sickness, what is? The Africans who arrived that day were slaves. They didn't land at Plymouth Rock. They didn't land at Ellis Island. They were not free men and women landing in a new world filled with hope and ready to begin an adventure in freedom and exploration. They arrived in exploitation. They were called cargo, human cargo. They had been captured in Kavasa, in the Ang Angolan region of Africa. They were merchants and homeowners and mothers and fathers and they were chained and sold as part of the transatlantic slave trade. Like every t pandemic, racism started small, primarily found in the southern states on plantations with slaves doing the agricultural work for white families, plus then because many of them were gifted artisans and builders building the schools and the universities and so many of the towns that we claim were built by others. Racism could not be contained. The pandemic of racism spread like wildfire across the Americas. Books were written, myths were created, lies were done, and art and film bolstered the foundation of this sickness, all established as truth to undergird and validate the disease. And little was done to stop the spread. This pandemic found receptors in every hamlet, every town, every city across our land. It spread from south to north, from north to, and east to west, and in its most virulent form, this pandemic led white people to beat, cheat, lynch, assassinate African Americans who seemed strong and healthy until they weren't alive anymore. The racism virus caused white people to crush black and brown people from embryo to grave. And when in full fevered form, racism brought the slaughter of hundreds of black children, women, and men 
in the most heinous and awful crimes committed across centuries to villages and towns and cities. Hate was the seed, and it grew. In order to feed the beast of racist disease perpetrated against black people, from the 20 and odd Africans of 1619, over the next 241 years, the slave population in this nation grew to 3.9 million by the 1860 census, with 500,000 free blacks. In the slave trade, at least two million slaves died in the water between Africa and the Americas. They either jumped overboard, died on board, or were thrown overboard. But historians have documented the mortality rates were even higher in Africa, with the capture of free people to be enslaved. Some have calculated the number of deaths directly related to slavery in the Americas between 1,500 and 1,900 as over 4 million. Does someone sense a pandemic? The numbers kept rising after the bloody Civil War, which was fought to end slavery. More than 4,400 Americans were lynched between 1877 and 1950 as free black Americans. The more a black man or woman prospered or did well for themselves, the greater the threat they faced from the Ku Klux Klan in their area and the greater chance they had of being lynched. This number doesn't even include those who died in police custody or who were not hung from lynching trees but forced out of their communities. This is sick. This is really sick to fight this sickness like the fight against COVID-19 will take a change of heart, it will take a change of behavior, it's gonna take all of us to change. Not a few, not just those who will march, but every single one of us. Almost 401 years of pandemic pain have brought us to this Sunday. So let us turn this pain into promise. Here are some of the steps to end the pandemic of racism forever. First, each one of us has to stop hating people in this country because of the color of their skin. Second, each one of us has to start loving all people regardless of the color of their skin. Third, we have to know that all of this is more than skin deep. We have to go deeper. We have to change police officers and departments that feel they have the right to rein abuse on their own and on those who are in black and brown communities. We have to take funding that is set up for militaristic response within these departments and turn these dollars over to the community to make a difference in healing all the wounds that are there. Fourth and most important, we have to do justice for all. By that I mean we have to find a way to figure out what has been taken from poor black and brown people and return it to them in the form of health care from embryo to the end of life, jobs and housing and education, stores that have healthy food and options, transportation and recreation places, and nonviolent community policing, all of this and more. We need to deal with a criminal justice system that is criminal. We have to get nonviolent inmates out of jail. We need to give real second chances before someone spends half a life in prison waiting for trumped up charges to be overturned and freed, even when the DNA evidence has been there for five or 10 years. We need to return to the, those who have been forsaken and dispossessed the full rights and privileges and opportunities they have as Americans. This is an amazing moment. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, and by the way, it scares me to see so many out there, and I worry for friends and colleagues and the fighters for this justice while battling racism, please be careful. God is empowering and inspiring each of us to deal with the pandemic of racism. We are being led by young black, brown, and white visionaries for change. And to watch them together, it's shoulder to shoulder all the way. There is a growing number right here in our congregation. This movement is for all of us. It must become a movement for all of us to eradicate racism. 
We have our youth to thank. Please read my first reflection since Friday, talking about Alicia Palmer, Sophia Poyo, Mia Provenzana, and Carly Kuchba, marching and protesting for change. And then yesterday, I heard that Caroline Thompson was marching too at 13 years old because her best friend from the time she was three and she decided it's time to get to the state house. So move over parents or join in because you are raising your kids right and they are leading us. Thanks be to God. Dr. Andrew Thomas and his son Jake were seen Friday night right at the heart of the OSU medical community witnessing for justice down by the Jake with Jake, masked and socially distanced. Reverend Emily Corzine was out leading a clergy witness for justice. Thank you, and thanks to all who are out there doing the right thing. So not all of us can march, but we can call, we can use our fingers, we can use our, our fingers, we can use our voices, we can call City Hall, we can call the State House, we can call the White House, we can call Congress, we can write, we can all do something to bring the change that's needed. It's got to come now. We must face racism and defeat it once and for all. This is the moment. Let's not move and lose this chance. In the words of the author James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. It is certainly in any case, it is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy of justice. And so you've got to stand and be just as fierce. Let us end this now. We are not alone in this effort to end racism. We have each other to uplift and support one, in this, one another in this battle to defeat the ugliness and hate of racism and injustice. We have the promises of God to sustain us. And oh yeah, we've got Jesus. Remember what he said today as he left his disciples to ascend to the side of his father. He said this, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus is always with us. Always is always. Outside of Christ's always, his love for us forever. There is one thing that we know. Everything must end that has a beginning. And this is the time for racism to end. Now and forever. Amen.